Okay, so now we're starting up section two. What'd you guys uh, think of the test? You guys did pretty well on it. It didn't seem too, too bad. Um, I'm either going to say it was because uh, you guys are too smart, uh, I am too good of a teacher, or... It's definitely not. It's definitely not that one. Probably you guys are too smart, so I'll probably have to make it harder for the next test. You know, I can't have my average being too high. Those 100s are like just little daggers in my heart, you know. Just, <laughs> Just kidding. No, you guys did really well. So I, I suspect that most of the tests are going to be pretty similar. So um, you know, every year uh, when we write a new test, typically it's you know taking the old one and kind of updating you know around 10% or so. So uh, I usually do a little bit more than that, probably 20 to 30% or so. So a lot of those are new questions um, that I wrote specifically. Um, so yeah, you guys are doing pretty well. Um, that's usually how I write a lot of my questions. Um, so I think you'll, if you did well on the first one, you know, continue doing what you're doing. You'll probably continue doing well on the on the subsequent one. So it's good, good to see. Okay, so uh, going into section two, uh, this is going to be pretty rapid fire. Uh, what, do you guys know when your next test is? Next Friday. Next Friday. Oh boy, we got to cover twelve hours of lecture in, in that time frame. So we're going to go through this stuff uh, pretty quick, uh, at least in a short number of days, at least. Uh, but here we go. We're going to start talking off about the the blood and the heart. Uh, so any vampires out there should be pretty. Uh, you guys. Um, we're going to talk uh, mainly about the blood and heart in the first section here, uh, then we'll talk about uh, the way blood circulated within the body. We'll talk about EKGs a little bit. Um, this is fun for me because my, you know, in pharmacy school you don't learn much about EKGs. You're like, they're just a bunch of squiggly lines on the screen and as long as they're squiggles, uh, it usually means the patient's alive and, and they're good, right? If it's just a straight line, no bueno. Um, but I've gotten to learn a lot about EKG, especially like during fellowship and getting to evaluate patients, especially with like drug overdoses and a lot of them, their cardiac effects, like how they actually affect an EKG. So we'll talk about those. Um, just a brief introduction, not getting, uh, you'll have a whole class in EKGs later on by Professor uh, Quinonez, we'll get super in depth on that. Uh, and then we'll talk about cardiac output and how your body manages blood flow to the body, making sure you're getting blood where it needs to go, when it needs to go. Uh, and then we'll follow up by talking about the immune system and then finally the respiratory system. So I'll probably be um, the line, uh, Pretty big section for the respiratory. It might be like kind of lecture five and six ish. We're gonna try to do the same format where we'll do um, whatever I can't finish up in class by that fifth class. We'll I'll post online uh, and then we'll do another in class review since you guys seem to, to like that. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to discuss cardiac function. We'll also look at some of the vascular regulatory systems. Uh, we'll talk about hematologic. Uh, physiology and how you generate a lot of your uh, your blood cells and, and, and formed elements within the plasma. Uh, we'll look at the role of the, some of those components and then talk about the clotting cascade and hemostasis. You guys have already gotten a little introduction to the clotting cascade? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Oh boy, it's a fun one, right? We're going to go in depth. Okay, so anyway, so let's talk about the composition structures of the heart. Uh, so first part, we're going to talk about just the, the functions and components of the circulatory system, what actually makes up the blood circulating through your body should be circulating. Um, basically, the heart we know is a four-chambered pump. What are the four chambers that we have? I how they divided. Atria and then, right, they have the atria and the ventricles. Uh, and then the blood vessels themselves can kind of be broken down into uh, kind of what uh, what they're transporting, uh, kind of where they're lying within the tissue. So uh, we have the arteries, which what do they, what do arteries do? Yeah, take blood away from the heart, right? Uh, we'll have the arterioles, which are you know kind of uh, further uh, branching of, of the arteries. The capillaries, where a lot of the oxygen exchange actually occurs uh, within the body, and then the venules, and finally the veins, right? So veins are going to be anything that's taking blood back to the heart, uh, which will be important. We're talking about things like the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins, uh, and if they're carrying oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. That's where we're kind of where things get a little hinky there. Um, but then we also have the lymphatic system, which we'll talk much more about in the fourth lecture, which will be uh, kind of the immune system. Uh, but you'll find that uh, we have our lymphatic vessels, uh, lymphoid tissues, and lymphatic organs specifically. So these are things like your spleen. If you ever were curious, what the heck does a spleen do? We'll learn about that. Uh, the thymus, tonsils, lymph nodes, all that good stuff. And then finally, the actual lymph tissue that circulates uh, within those organs. So composition of the blood. So typically when we're talking about blood, we're uh, kind of talking about these kind of whole blood components. We have the plasma itself, which uh, roughly makes up about 54 to 55% of your, your given blood, right? And so about 92% uh, of that's going to be water. 
you know, unless you have like dehydration or something like that, but it should be mostly water. And then we're going to have 7% of that's going to be these proteins. Okay. And then the other 45 to 46% of that should be made of these formed elements, which are essentially just the cells that are floating around within the bloodstream. Uh, so this includes like your red blood cells, your, your white blood cells, and then also your platelets. Obviously the majority of this should be your red blood cells. Uh, you can find, when do you think you'd have shifts in the number of like white blood cells that you have? Yeah, infection is a big one, right? So you're going to find there's an incredible ability for the body to kind of flex uh, production of a lot of these cells uh, in order to kind of uh, respond to these different kinds of stimuli, right? So for instance, like, you know, if you don't have enough oxygen in the bloodstream, your body's going to flex by making more more red blood cells and more hemoglobin uh, consequently. And so you're going to find there's a lot of, uh, again, trying to maintain homeostasis, the body's going to have the ability to flex in order to, to meet those uh, needs. So uh, specifically, when we're talking about the plasma proteins that we have, and again, on this picture, you can kind of see how things are being broken down. Uh, albumin is a major, major uh, serum protein that we have floating around, and this helps to provide this osmotic pressure. And what does osmotic pressure do for us? keeps fluid within the blood vessel. Yeah, so keep fluid within the blood vessels is what we like to see. So again, um, that water content, a lot of it is being held in um, not only with the proteins, but also what's kind of our main cation that helps to uh, have that oncotic pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a lot of sodium floating around in the bloodstream. That also provides a lot of that oncotic pressure, right? So again, think about that tonicity that we have. Um, the nice thing with uh, the plasma proteins, they can't really partition into cells super easily as you know, as we would see with like sodium. You know, sodium has channels and things like that. They get into the intracellular space. You don't really see any shifting of the albumin. Most of it should be staying within uh, the actual bloodstream itself. This is also really important when we talk about drugs because uh, a lot of drugs are bound by serum proteins and albumin is going to be a major one uh, for this. Um, so you can run into problems when you have patients who are uh, malnourished because you oftentimes uh, will find patients who are not eating appropriately or are getting the right nourishment. Um, they're not generally producing on enough proteins. And so this is one of the things we're actually going to be looking at is, is that albumin. So if uh, you have a patient who looks malnourished, they're losing weight, they come in, their albumin levels are low, that can lead to things like dysregulation in their blood pressure. Um, sometimes we have to actually supplement that by giving uh, extra albumin uh, to these patients in order to make sure they have enough oncotic pressure to hold all that fluid in uh, the, uh, the blood vessels. So that's a really important one. Uh, and then we have our globulins, which are other serum proteins. You have the alpha and beta globulins. These are important for transporting things like lipids and fat-soluble vitamins uh, throughout the bloodstream. And then uh, the gamma globulins. We'll talk much more about these in lecture four, talking about antibodies that help to uh, develop immunity against uh, specific pathogens. And then uh, one last one is going to be fibrinogen. This will be important when we get to the clotting cascade because uh, this actually helps us to form those kind of fibrin clots, right? Uh, so you know, when you have a clot, what is it more, mostly made out of? Yeah, so a lot of fibrin. What else is in a, a clot? Platelets. Yeah, platelets are the other thing. You'll have some red blood cells that get kind of caught up in there, but it's usually a lot of platelets and fibrin. Fibrin's kind of the glue that holds everything together, essentially. So we'll look at that uh, a little bit later on in this lecture. Uh, next, we have our formed elements, and so uh, obviously the erythrocytes and platelets are going to be major ones we'll talk about, and then we'll get into the uh, you know a little bit about the functions of our uh, different uh, other cells. We'll talk much more about these when we get to the uh, immune lecture a little bit later on. So uh, hematopoiesis uh, is basically this generation of red blood cells. Uh, we can see that uh, we have hematopoietic stem cells uh, that are available, you know, right from, uh, you know, shortly after conception, basically in that embryonic yolk sac that is going to be generating red blood cells for uh, the growing fetus. You're, you'll find that some other tissues will also end up making some red blood cells as well, kind of really early on in life, including like the liver, the spleen, and also the lymph nodes. Um, over time, though, you're going to find that those uh, ability for those organs to make red blood cells will diminish. Uh, to where you're only going to mainly be having uh, red blood cells being produced in the marrow uh, specifically. Mostly in that last month of gestation after birth, that's when they're going to be mainly switching over to just the red blood cells being made in, in the marrow. Now, do all of your bones make red blood cells? No, right? So it's just over time. Uh, early on in life, all bones are going to be producing red blood cells, you know, up until around age five. You can uh, kind of like this graph because you can see kind of how that, uh, that shift in where the majority of red blood cells are being made over time. So you see things like the tibia, the femur, usually are going to be decreasing pretty steadily uh, throughout the early years of life until the time you're about uh, around 20 to 30. Most of those should have shut down for the most part. Later on in life, after year 20 especially, mostly it's going to be the vertebrae, the sternum, the ribs, and the ilia, which are going to be producing the majority of your red blood cells. Everything else is kind of shut off. Uh, I don't know the actual specific reason why that is, but uh, it might be a good thing to look up. 
And so basically when we're looking at uh, uh, you know, processing and, and producing some of these other blood cells that we have, um, we have these hematopoietic stem cells um, that give rise basically to all of these different uh, cell lines, essentially. So we, uh, another name for this is going to be pluripotent stem cell, basically meaning it's able to differentiate into several different type of cell lines. So here you have this multipotential my laser pointer. Here you have this multipotential hemopoietic stem cell. Again, this is pluripotent because it's able to be, you know, based on different uh, different factors, different uh, different chemokines that will be able to influence. It can shunt it into the, you know, say the myeloid progenitors or the lymphoid progenitors. And so, for instance, you know, if you're having an infection, you might be uh, more prone to produce one cell line versus the other uh, versus if you were not having an active infection. And so uh, you can have things like growth inducers. So these are things like your, uh, some of your interleukins, as an example. Lots of other growth inducers that are out there. Um, again, we'll get into more of the detail on those when we get uh, later on um, and talk about the immune lecture. Uh, and then basically these differentiation inducers. So basically saying, okay, well, right now we need uh, more red blood cells. We're going to be able to shunt this myeloid progenitor into specifically producing erythrocytes versus producing, say, more uh, uh, more mast cells, for instance. So again. Uh, Based on what the body needs, you're able to produce those different differentiators to get you into that specific pathway. So looking at formation of the red blood cells, you can see the genesis here starts with this pro-erythroblast, uh, and as it starts to differentiate and gets kind of further and further down that cell line where it's going to be producing natural erythrocytes, uh, notice here it's also losing its DNA. It doesn't really have a nucleus anymore. Uh, it doesn't really have mitochondria. So there's not a whole lot of actual production that can occur um, or protein production that occurs within the red blood cells themselves. Notice uh, is what kind of normal erythrocytes would look like. Certainly, we can have some aberrations that can occur based on uh, several different things. So, for instance, uh, we'll talk about things that cause microcytic anemia. Uh, we can talk about things that form sickle cell anemia. Uh, you can have uh, alterations and things like hemoglobin that can form this. Um, I think alloblastic anemia has to do with a lot of like kind of the precursors that we need in order to make uh, things like hemoglobin. So, we'll talk about all these a little bit more in detail as we, as we go forward. Okay, so the main thing that is going to be stimulating red blood cell production is going to be erythropoietin. We already discussed this as being uh, produced where? In the kidneys, absolutely. So this is a big problem we have for a lot of patients who have chronic kidney issues. That as you have uh, destruction of the kidneys over time, uh, you're going to find they don't really produce enough EPO themselves. And so they run into anemia. Also, we said that a lot of uh, those, dial uh, those patients go on dialysis, so we're taking a lot of blood out of them. So they end up having this kind of chronic anemia. And so we can supplement by giving exogenous erythropoietin. So that's one thing we can do to try to help stimulate the body to start producing more red blood cells. Really the big balance here is that you need to maintain oxygen delivery to the tissues and also not impeding blood flow. Because what's the problem with having too many red blood cells? Yeah, basically kind of sludging up the works essentially, right? So um, you notice when we talked about the percentage of your blood that is the formed elements, we said it's roughly how much? Around 45% or so. If it was, say, something like 60% all red blood cells, basically you'd have so many of those basically clogging the, the arteries and the veins that things would eventually form uh, an embolus, right? And so we don't want to have that. Um, that's where we can see issues with patients who uh, were blood doping. You guys are familiar with that process? Mm -hmm. What's blood doping? <coughs> yeah, so like Tour de France is a, kind of notorious for that. What, what, is the, what do they actually do? Yeah, so they would take some of their own blood out in a lot of cases. They would store it for later use, and then before they need to uh, go for an event, they would end up infusing that blood back into their body to try to artificially increase their, their hemoglobin uh, concentration. That would increase the amount of oxygen they could deliver to the tissues, uh, which they need when they're cycling for, you know, how many ever miles the, the Tour de France is. Uh, but again, when you're exercising pretty vigorously, what does your fluid balance do? Yeah, so it typically goes down because you're sweating a lot. All of a sudden, now you have much more concentrated red blood cells, and then they just get sludged up, and then you get things like stroke happening, right? Cerebrovascular accidents that can happen secondary to that. So the balance is to make sure that we have good flow of blood, but we also can get adequate um, oxygen delivered to the tissue. So um, what are some things that can influence the amount of oxygen getting to the tissue? Well, certainly things like elevation. Um, so that's why uh, one time I, I, we had a conference in uh, Colorado. We actually got to go to Denver uh, for a tox conference. And boy, let me tell you what, stairs have never been so difficult to, to go up than going from sea level here 
uh, probably actually below sea level a little bit, all the way up to you know a mile high. Um, it's very difficult to, to get around. I was just walking on one set of stairs. I'm like, this is terrible. I need to get back to Florida, right? Because I'm not used to having that extra hemoglobin to carry around that oxygen. My body hasn't had time to adapt to it. I'm sure if I've been there for a few weeks, things would have uh, adapted over time as my uh, kidneys start to produce more EPO. It gets that signal by having this decreased tissue oxygenation, which will stimulate the kidney to produce more erythropoietin. Then it goes to that process of the uh, hematopoietic stem cells finally getting down to the red blood cells. Have you guys ever seen people training with these kind of high altitude masks? Look kind of silly, right? So that, what's the idea with these masks? Right, so it's trying to cut off oxygen so they're not breathing as much when they're working out and that way it will stimulate more hemoglobin. Um, how effective do you think these are? Not nah, very. That's kind of silly when you see people doing this because they're only doing it for you know the 30 minutes to an hour that they're working out and the other 23 hours of the day they're getting plenty of oxygen. It doesn't really work so well. But if, if, you know, they think they look cooler like Bane, then I guess that's, that's fine for them. <laughs> but the actual efficacy is probably not super great. Um, huh? There could be a placebo. Effect. I don't think kidneys listen to that and make any more EPOs. It might be a good study you guys could do for your graduate project. So. Um, Right, so other things that could also affect your, your tissue oxygenation, if you have things like low blood volume, uh, so you have anemia, so again, if you're thinking like you know, trauma patients, if they had uh, massive blood loss secondary to trauma, that would also increase this uh, EPO uh, uh, expression. Things like uh, poor blood flow or pulmonary disease, anything that's kind of impeding the amount of a tissue uh, getting oxygen is going to help stimulate this process here. Kind of that. Those made the, like, the diaphragm stronger, it made it like, harder to breathe. Uh, I don't know if they're doing it for diaphragmatic exercise. It, really it certainly makes it harder to breathe. They're certainly not getting enough oxygen. You get really, really ripped diaphragms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so maybe there's some conditioning aspects to it too. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems miserable to me as someone with asthma. Like, ooh, the idea of not breathing is, is not a good one. So. I just basically rub a bunch of cats on my face and then my bronchial smooth muscle constricts and then I can go do the same thing basically. <laughs> just kidding, I don't like cats. So anywho, so uh, some of the things that we need, the cofactors that we need to produce these red blood cells uh, and specifically to make hemoglobin, uh, we're going to have things like iron are going to be really necessary for this. So iron, uh, iron based anemia is, is a very common problem uh, where they basically need this cofactor to make the actual hemoglobin itself. B12 and folic acid is also necessary uh, because you need these to actually make thymidine, right? We need thymidine to help with the uh, DNA synthesis and some of those kind of pro uh, erythrocyte uh, cells, right? They, they still have the nucleus. They're still causing mitosis to occur. And if they can't get those cofactors in order to make thymidine and things like that, they're not going to be able to get to the full process. And we'll see some of the, um, uh, usually like megaloblastic anemia is a big thing that happens there. Basically, you don't have enough of the cells fully differentiating because they don't have those factors needed to make uh, the, the DNA that they need. But um, essentially, when we're looking at um, the, the processing of these cells, uh, basically, we can see that the, the diet's going to be really important to get things like your B12, your, your folic acid, and your, and your iron. And you're going to see that that's going to lead to uh, red blood cell production. Right, you said uh, the vertebrae is one place where that's going to happen. That'll end up producing the red blood cells. Usually, the, the lifespan of red blood cells is around 120 days or so. Um, you, know, you can find some differentiation there depending on if they have other disease states, but usually around 120 days. Um, as those get uh, old, they go through that senescence process and they're going to get uh, processed out. Usually you're finding that the macrophages are really important for metabolizing that hemoglobin. It's going to break it down into uh, iron and bilirubin. Bilirubin we know is important for uh, helping to uh, do things like emulsify fats and things like that through the diet. So it actually gets sent through the bile into the small intestine where I can actually help with uh, digestion of food and things. Um, the actual, the other protein bits of it can be broken down to amino acids for later, later recycling essentially. So that's kind of the, the general lifespan or the general life cycle of these uh, red blood cells and some of these cofactors needed to, to produce them. Uh, looking more specifically at vitamin B12 or cyanocobalamin, um, this is actually kind of interesting. We give, um, this is the activated form, we have cyanocobalamin, we actually give, um, I notice uh, uh, the cyan there, it actually uh, contains cyanide in it, uh, but it's not actually dangerous to you, right? Uh, when you have patients have cyanide poisoning, what we actually do is give you a drug called hydroxocobalamin, which is the inactivated form of B12, and then that combines with the cyanide, and all of a sudden now you have just regular B12, just a nice water-soluble vitamin. So it's kind of a nice way we can deal with cyanide poisoning, which is relatively new. 
But regardless, uh, in order to absorb this from the GI tract, you have to have what we call intrinsic factor. Let me abbreviate as IF here. Uh, basically, the IF that gets secreted from uh, these parietal cells within the stomach, uh, that's going to help to prevent the B12 from being broken down with those stomach acids, right? So the IF kind of helps to protect it. Uh, it's going to get down into the small intestine, and then it can be absorbed. <laughs> This process is going to occur through that pinocytosis. Essentially, those cells in the small intestine will kind of uh, sense that the IF is there, going to bind those receptors, and they'll trigger the cell to kind of intake them uh, through that, that pinocytosis process there. I mentioned if you don't have enough B12 in your diet, that leads to that kind of pernicious anemia where basically you cannot produce uh, enough of those red blood cells uh, due to just lack of uh, either you can have lack of intrinsic factor or lack of the B12 in the diet can uh, lead to this. So the synthesis uh, of the hemoglobin itself is going to uh, begin in that pro erythroblast stage and it's going to continue all the way down to the reticulocyte stage. It kind of goes on for a decent period of time there. Um, basically what you find is that the formation of hemoglobin itself, you're going to have the succinyl CoA. You guys remember from the Krebs cycle, right? It's already or blocked that out already. Okay, that's understandable. Uh, that's basically going to form with glycine to form this uh, molecule called pyrrole. Basically four pyrroles are going to combine together to make this protoporphyrin 9. Okay. Protoporphyrin 9 plus iron actually forms this heme molecule. So you can see the heme molecule kind of right here uh, within the hemoglobin. And then uh, you're going to have four chains uh, are going to come together and that eventually makes, I'm sorry, the heme combines with the polypeptide chain. So you can notice these kind of alpha subunit chains, these beta chains, uh, four of those combined together, usually two alphas and two betas, and that's going to form your molecule of hemoglobin, right? And so you can find chain alterations. So if you were to have things like amino acid substitutions uh, based on you know, genetic uh, differentiation in patients, um, you can end up what we call with uh, sickle cell anemia. Okay? So sickle cell is basically where you are uh, substituting glutamic acid uh, in those beta chains, or valine is being substituted for glutamic acid. And what that does is kind of change um, the ability for the hemoglobin to kind of stay in solution, essentially. Uh, when you get into kind of low oxygen situations, you're going to find that you have these kind of crystals that form within the red blood cells and causes them to form that sickle shape, and they don't really flow super well. Um, they end up kind of getting occluded within the blood vessels, and this can lead to lots of like pain crises, can lead to poor oxygenation of the tissues, and all kinds of problems. So um, that's why even where the mainstays of therapy when you have a patient with sickle cell crisis is to give them give them oxygen, right? It helps to get that uh, get that tissue or get the hemoglobin kind of back in the solution to prevent that from occurring, right? So uh, looking at iron, do you guys know what this molecule is called? It's called a Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. So um, total body iron, uh, you have roughly four to five grams uh, within the blood uh, within your body itself. About 65% of that's going to be in the hemoglobin. The rest of it will be stored in the tissues for uh, other needs. Basically, what happens is you have this pro protein called apotransferrin gets secreted into the bile. That's going to combine with iron from the diet itself to actually form this transferrin. Once again, transferrin is going to get absorbed through uh, the GI epithelia through pinocytosis because, again, uh, the molecule itself is not able to cross uh, that lipid bilayer on its own. Uh, and then it gets released into the capillaries uh, as plasma transferrin. So you can kind of see this process occurring here. We have iron being absorbed. You have this transferrin that can be uh, circulating within the plasma. It's not free iron itself, uh, but then eventually that's going to get into the tissues. Uh, it can uh, dissociate itself and become free iron where it can be used for other metabolic processes. Otherwise, it's going to be stored as iron plus apoferritin to form ferritin. So again, you're gonna, everyone has kind of a, a storage capacity for iron. Uh, if you overcome that, you can have, end up having too much free iron, and that's where you get iron toxicity from. Uh, so if you guys ever uh, take a tox class or we talk about iron poisoning, um, that's basically where you end up overcoming the ability to, to store a lot of this iron. You basically run out of apoferritin. But um, how do we get rid of iron? Uh, basically, you can bleed it out. That's one way to get rid of it. Um, so we can see like menses is one way that uh, you know, female patients are going to be losing a, a, a little bit of iron every single uh, month or you know, depending on, on when they get their periods. The rest of it ends up being excreted through uh, the feces. Uh, and so again, this, your body has a lot easier time uh, absorbing iron than it does necessarily getting rid of it. So a lot, in a lot of cases, if your body has good iron stores, um, it's not necessarily trying to get rid of extra iron through like the feces or blood. Uh, more likely, it's going to be preventing further absorption of, of iron from the GI tract, okay? So you're gonna find with some of these products that instead of um, regulating uh, elimination of it, we're really regulating the absorption of it instead. So we see that a lot with like calcium, uh, specifically with like absorption of calcium, Calcium, vitamin D, things like PTH are really important for causing absorption of calcium. Um, uh, so again, regulation of uh, absorption more important here for iron than it is for elimination. 
So again, um, you can have patients, especially if you have patients who have uh, especially heavy menses, uh, you can end up having uh, decreased iron stores, which end up leading to anemia associated with that. Um, so that can lead to, you guys know, ever heard of like pica? What is, what is pica? You eat stuff you shouldn't. So you have uh, anemic patients, what do they typically uh, end up eating? Yeah, ice is a big one. So my boss in, in fellowship, um, she was a, a very pale, uh, thin lady, and she just chewed ice all the time. She knew she had an iron deficiency. She was, you know, she's a pharmacist as well, so she knew kind of what the deal was. But for whatever reason, she's always chewing ice. You know, so uh, if you see that, that's probably what it has to do is that the body is stimulating that that desire for iron. Um, that also carries over to chewing ice for whatever reason. I don't actually know the pathway for that, uh, but basically, uh, that's a good sign that hey, your patient probably needs some iron in their body. Okay, so some uh, food sources that we can get. Uh, th these are things we should be encouraging, especially anemic patients, to help them produce uh, healthy red blood cells and, and hemoglobin. For B12, you can find it in things like eggs, meat, and poultry. Uh, don't be so so shellfish with your B12. Um, milk products, things like that, all have a pretty decent amount of B12. Uh, you probably pound a five-hour energy or something like that and get a decent amount as well. Um, iron, obviously, is going to be found in a lot of meat products. Uh, you can also find it in things like potatoes, uh, broccoli, you know, uh, beans, things like that. So again, even if you have a vegetarian or vegan patient, they can hopefully still get a decent amount uh, of these products. If not, they should be taking at least multivitamins or things like that to get their adequate uh, intake. Uh, folate, you can find in things like avocado, asparagus, uh, Brussels sprouts. You know, so there's lots of products that are out there. As long as you're eating kind of a well-balanced diet, for the most part, you should be getting uh, enough of these uh, factors in to, to produce good red blood cells. Okay, so moving on and talking about the formed elements specifically. So the hemoglobin itself gets incorporated into the uh, the erythrocytes or the red blood cells. And these are kind of these flattened biconcave discs. Uh, so again, these are going to be able to flow pretty well. They're pretty flexible for the most part and are able to get around uh, you know, even small capillaries and things like that based on that. That's the problem we saw with the sickle cell patients is that when they end up having the, the, the uh, precipitation of those crystals within the red blood cells causing that sickle shape, um, they're not very flexible and they end up getting caught in tissues in a lot of cases. They end up caught, getting caught in those, those capillaries. Um, that can also lead to hemolysis, which what is it, hemolysis? Yeah, it's lysis of the, the red blood cells, essentially. So uh, when you have patients have increased hemolysis, they're also leaking out a lot of these products into the bloodstream, which can be pretty problematic in a lot of cases. So we'll see, um, especially with patients who have uh, hemolytic anemias and things like that, like they have a lot of issues with these red blood cells being destroyed at an increased rate. But uh, basically, their main function, just to transport hemoglobin and oxygen around uh, the tissues in the body. Typically, a normal level you'd see for a male patient around 15 grams per deciliter. Uh, for females, usually around 14 grams per deciliter. Uh, and then the hematocrit, which what is hematocrit? Is that her percentage of red blood cells? It's almost there. <laughs> So basically, if you're looking at the actual plasma itself, what percentage of that is going to be uh, made of red blood cells, right? So we saw when you kind of, if you were to take a, a blood sample and you were to spin it down, you could see that, you know, we saw that uh, roughly, you know, 55% of it's going to be the plasma. The other 45% was like formed elements, right? And so maybe 44% of that is going to be the red blood cells. Okay, so it's basically that percentage of the entire plasma of what is specifically red blood cells. That's your hematocrit. Um, what do you think could affect your hematocrit? And we mentioned dehydration is a big one. So if you were to decrease the amount of, uh, bless you, if you're able to decrease the amount of water that was found in the plasma, that's going to concentrate and cause your hematocrit to go up or down. Up. Yeah, and I'm going up because your your blood's getting more concentrated. So uh, the other thing, the other side of that could happen as well. If you were to get uh, overhydrated, you can end up seeing your hematocrit go down in those cases because it's less less concentrated. So again, we don't want the hematocrit to get too high because that could indicate that we're having you know sludging of the blood that could lead to uh, problems with, with uh, blood flow. Uh, one of the major enzymes uh, we've kind of alluded to previously uh, that are found in the red blood cells would be this carbonic anhydrase. We know that's really important for maintaining this buffer system. Uh, typically, when you have red blood cells that are going to be over in the tissues, um, you're going to have a higher or lower concentration of, of CO2. Should be a higher concentration of CO2 than, than I guess as compared to the lungs, right? So when you're out in the tissues, like because you're having oxidative phosphorylation, you should be producing CO2 in those cases. Uh, and we'll talk about this uh, oxid. Um, oxygen hemoglobin desaturation curve. We'll talk much more about that in the respiratory section, but essentially you're going to find a lot more CO2 out in the tissues and that's going to be uptaken into these uh, red blood cells. Okay, That'll be combined with water 
bicarbonic anhydrase, and that's going to end up forming your bicarbonate plus your hydrogen ion. And that so it helps kind of establish this uh, this buffer system because we don't like to carry around a ton of CO2 within the blood necessarily or have a, a certain amount, uh, but we want to try to get this over into the lungs where it can expel the CO2. That exchange can happen. It can pick up more oxygen and then get back out to the tissues essentially. Okay. Um, notice here when uh, you're having this kind of co-transporter to where uh, if you're getting rid of bicarbonate, if you're kind of leaking that out in order to help you know, with the buffer system, you also bring chloride in, right? So it's keeping kind of a net neutral uh, effect on here where you're losing uh, a negatively charged uh, um, ion, you're bringing in uh, a negatively charged ion there, okay? And again, uh, notice that they are lacking nuclei and mitochondria, so they can't really produce, you know, uh, one red blood cell cannot produce uh, more red blood cells themselves. It has to be done uh, through the marrow. Uh, and then they typically have a 120-day lifespan. Uh, they most often get disposed of in the spleen. Um, so you'll find that within the spleen they have these like trabeculae, and this is kind of like the, the red blood cell graveyard in a lot of cases where um, old red blood cells will get taken up by the spleen and they get processed down uh, where they can uh, utilize some of those products for, for recycling. We mentioned the hemoglobin itself. It's metabolized by the macrophages. That's where it can get bilirubin from. That's where the iron can then be recycled. Uh, so the body's pretty good at recycling a lot of these products uh, for later use. On the other side of that, we have our leukocytes, and so uh, we have mainly the white blood cells, also known as leukocytes. Um, they do have nuclei and mitochondria, and they're going to be moving kind of more in this amoeboid-type fashion uh, in order to get around. Um, you're going to find there's two main branches of the uh, leukocytes. You're going to have the agranular leukocytes, which mainly are going to um, include your lymphocytes and your monocytes. We'll talk about their specific purposes in a minute. Uh, and then the granular leukocytes, so neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. So again, you can kind of see the granules that are kind of dissolved uh, or they're there within the cell if you're looking at it on a microscope. Um, the way that I remembered uh, this differentiation, and I had lots of goofy um, mnemonics to remember this when I was in farm school, uh, basically the agranulocytes, I just remember little monkeys. And then for the granulocytes, never eat bananas. So little monkeys and granulocytes never eat bananas, granulocytes. If it helps anyone, go for it. If not, then just disregard that last 30-second stream of consciousness. Okay. Um, so for your granular leukocytes, they typically are going to live around 48 hours uh, within the actual blood uh, once they get released from the marrow. But you find that with a lot of these cells, and we'll talk about this more in detail later, um, once they get into the tissues, they can live for a longer periods of time. So usually around four to five days or so within the tissue. Um, for the neutrophils themselves, these are oftentimes going to be the kind of first response to things like bacteria or uh, infection and things like that because they are in the greatest number. If you notice here, so we have a lot of neutrophils that are floating around the bloodstream. They can kind of respond to things pretty quickly and in big numbers, and they kind of help with um, phagocytosis of microbes, so both viruses and bacteria, okay? Uh, we'll talk more about this process, but this is one of the big things we look at when you're evaluating someone for an infection. Not only do you look to see are their white blood cells increased, but you're looking to see which white blood cells are increased. In a lot of cases, we can look at their neutrophil count, we can see what percentage that is in order to tell us, you know, uh, if it's increased, it's maybe more likely to be a bacterial infection. Um, sometimes if you end up seeing higher counts of other ones, it could uh, be indicative of like, you know, a parasitic infection or, or things like that. So again, it's not only that you're looking at the white blood cell count, which should go up in response to infection, but we're also looking at uh, the actual com uh, composition of those white blood cells. There's also a big thing we look at when we have patients who have leukemia, right? So leukemia would be, is it what? It's a cancer. What's actually happening with leukemia? What, what cells are dividing? It's a lot of these, yeah, usually it's a lot of these immature white blood cells, and so you'll find there's uh, lymphocytic leukemias and there's myelocytic leukemias, so it kind of differentiates based on the cell line. Um, but essentially, when we're giving chemotherapy, these are one of the, the first cells that end up taking a hit, is their immune system, and the white blood cells in particular. So we're also looking for things like their neutrophils. We're looking at those counts. And so if we see that they're having a big drop in their neutrophils, we know they can't respond to bacterial infections very well. We know they're a bigger risk for infection, okay? And so a lot of times you'll find that, that it's not the cancer that kills some of these patients, it's actually the infections they get from being immune suppressed. Okay, so this is one of the things we're going to be looking at as neutrophils to see what their count is, to see how likely they are to get infection or not. So kind of just some uh, sneak previews for when you talk about uh, chemotherapy later on. Um, you have your basophils, and so these are going to be releasing uh, the anticoagulant heparin, because uh, you know normally when you have like an infection going on, you're having a lot of inflammation, that usually is going to be triggering off the clotting cascade, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but you don't necessarily always want clots to occur, and so we're going to look at the function of heparin and how that works to to uh, stop clots uh, to help dissolve them a little bit uh, faster because we still want to have blood flow occurring to those areas. Uh, it also release histamine, which stimulates inflammation. Do you guys know uh, familiar with histamine and what that does in the body? Where do you see a lot of histamine release occurring? Allergies. Yeah, usually like allergies and things like that. It causes uh, blood vessels to dilate. Um, so again, if you think about like if you have like a, a skin infection, uh, what happens to the skin around that infection? It's red. It gets red. 
gets hot, right? Because you're trying to increase blood flow to that area. And so histamine can be one of those things that does that, where you see a lot of the blood vessel dilation happening due to uh, the histamine there. So that can be one thing that helps to stimulate inflammation. Uh, serotonin is also going to be another big factor that helps to intensify that inflammation as well. Okay, so just know that these are going to be important modulators here. Uh, this is why, you know, sometimes we'll give antihistamines in order to block that effect to try to tamp down some of that inflammation as well. Uh, we have our eosinophils. These are going to be associated uh, specifically with allergic reactions and also with asthma. So sometimes with patients with asthma, um, you will find they have increased eosinophil counts. Um, this is actually useful for degrading some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, things like histamine. So it can help to break those down a little bit more quickly. Um, you also find eosinophils are useful for fighting parasitic infections. Um, they actually help to secrete enzymes that work to dissolve clots in some cases. Uh, and they will also help with these antigen antibody complexes and kind of signal these cells uh, uh, to uh, induce phagocytosis, try to envelop those bacteria and then break them down. Again, more detail in this in a couple lectures. Uh, then we have our monocytes. These are also going to be one of your main uh, phagocytic cells where basically uh, they are uh, monocytes differentiate in these macrophages. So these are much bigger than your neutrophils, uh, able to envelop larger molecules and or, or more larger uh, uh, organisms in order to break them down. Uh, and then again, their main function is really just to, to break down these bacteria. Uh, they can usually do uh, several bacteria at a time, try to break them all down to try to fight that infection. Uh, and then finally, your lymphocytes. These are going to be uh, providing that immune response, mainly your antibodies, uh, where you're finding like your T helper cells and your T killer cells and things like that. So again, more detail later on. Okay, also important here are going to be our platelets. These are going to be coming from these mega karyocytes. So you notice these kind of big cells here, uh, and they're getting broken down to eventually form your thrombocytes or your platelets. Um, you're going to find that these also lack nuclei, and these are typically pretty short-lived for the most part. So uh, only five to nine days or so that they're going to be circulating around in the bloodstream. Um, these are really important for helping to clot off blood, uh, and they are also going to be affected by lots of different... Um, Clotting factors, as we're going to see as we move forward, you're going to have things like von Willebrand factor, and you're going to have things like ADP and other things that can all stimulate these platelets to form uh, uh, these clots that occur. And fibrinogen is also going to be another big thing that happens there. So you can kind of notice fibrin, uh, the activated platelets, uh, you'll notice how they kind of have these conformational changes that will occur that allow them to kind of stick together uh, and allow that clot to form. Also causes uh, serotonin, because again, when you have uh, bleeding that's occurring, do you necessarily want to cause vasodilation to those vessels? Probably not, that would increase the bleeding, right? So uh, in some cases, actually really serotonin that helps to stimulate the vasoconstriction. Uh, they'll help to limit that blood flow to the, the injured vessel, essentially. So uh, again, a good uh, table kind of going through the different uh, formed elements in the blood. Uh, again, we'll go through the immune system a little bit more detail later on. Um, these are good numbers to kind of keep in mind as far as counts go. Uh, I probably won't be testing specifically on saying like, what's a normal neutrophil percentage? Like you'll you'll be able to figure that out. And also like when you're working in the hospital, they tell you all the normal values anyway. And also when you go from hospital to hospital, they have a little bit of different normal values. Uh, so you'll learn over time kind of what the, the normal values kind of are, um, but I'm not gonna test you specifically on what those are in this class. Okay. Uh, next, we'll talk a little bit about uh, antigens and antibodies, uh, at least in regards to when we're talking about things like um, a blood type uh, and also, uh, you know, whether uh, rho D uh, antigens. So, uh, essentially, when we're talking about red blood cell antigens and blood typing, uh, antigens or it's a glutenogen, is going to be found on the surface of our red blood cells, and it helps the, the uh, body basically recognize self cells, right? Because otherwise, if we had the cells, you know, if we had our immune system attacking our red blood cells, it could cause hemolysis and all kinds of problems. We don't want that to occur. Uh, we want to keep our red blood cells around as much as we can. And so you're going to find that it has these antigens uh, that are on the cell surface that allow the body to, to recognize that, yes, this is, this is myself. Um, you also have these uh, antibodies or these agglutinins. These are going to be secreted by lymphocytes in response when they notice that there's going to be a foreign uh, cell around, right? So you're going to notice that the, the, uh, if you were to inject, say, a foreign product into the body, foreign proteins, things like that, the, the, uh, the lymphocytes are going to be generating those antibodies against that uh, that will able to kind of target those cells. It's going to bind to that antigen and then target it for, for destruction later on, okay? or trigger an immune response or whatever it happens to be. We run into this um, pretty frequently when we are dealing with uh, patients who have been bitten by coral snakes. Uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but Florida is probably the, the capital for coral snake bites. Uh, and so in order to counteract that, we give antivenom. 
which are basically going to be these antibodies that we generate that actually get them out of horses. Uh, and so we can give these antibodies that will actually go and target the, the snake venom and actually bind it up and prevent it from causing uh, the problems that it causes. Um, but one of the problems we have when you have uh, horse antibodies floating around your bloodstream, that also is going to be noticed as not being self, right? Uh, horse proteins look different enough from human proteins that the body says, hey, we don't like that. And it will trigger an immune re response to that. So we see a lot of anaphylactic reactions that can happen. But essentially, when we have our own cells, we want to make sure that if we're giving someone blood, Especially, you know, if they need transfusion for trauma or if they have anemia or something like that, we want to make sure they're not going to, uh, the body's not going to be targeting those cells for destruction. We want to make sure we keep those around as, as best we can. So essentially, we had this ABO system of antigens that are going to be on the erythrocyte cell surfaces. Uh, so we have type A, which means you have the type A antigen. You can have type B, which has the B antigen present. And then you'll have type AB that has both A and B present. Right? And a lot of this is dependent on your parent. And then you're going to have type O, which means they have neither the A nor the B antigen. So essentially, you can kind of see in this picture here, uh, they're producing these antigens. You'll notice that they will have plasma antibodies available uh, for the opposite problem or for the opposite um, antigen. OK, so if I have blood type A, then I'm probably going to end up having B antigen uh, antibodies available to attack B type blood. OK, if you have type uh, B blood, you have these B antigens, you're going to produce A antibodies. So that way, if you get A blood injected into your body, you would uh, be able to attack those and get rid of them because it would notice as a foreign cell. If you have type AB blood, you would have both antigens on the cell surface, and then you'd have no of these, uh, none of these antibodies. Okay, this will be important when we're talking about like who is the universal donor versus the universal receiver when we talk about blood transfusions. Uh, and then finally, type O is going to have no uh, antigens available on the cell surface, and this means they are going to have both uh, antibodies against A and B available. Okay. So, what is the clinical importance of this? So, who can get what? Is the question, right? So what type of blood can they get uh, is, is a big thing, and especially when you have a patient. Uh, for instance, you have a trauma that happens, say a car wreck happened right out here, we wheel a patient in. Um, what type of blood do you want to give them? Well, you, well, it depends on what type of blood they have, right? But you're not going to know that off the bat. So that's why it's really important uh, when we talk about blood donations and things like that, that we have uh, adequate quantities of a specific type of blood. Uh, we'll talk about it in just um, a little bit more in detail in just a second. I guess I already called the right answer. Um, so again, when we're looking at this, it is going to be dependent on what type of blood they can receive is based on the antigens and the antibodies they have present. So type A blood, they can receive type A no problem, right? Um, they can also receive O because, again, the O blood is not going to have any antigens available on the cell surface. The body has no antibodies to react to it. Okay, so we're going to find that O blood typically is going to be kind of the universal donor because um, they have no antigens present. The body is not going to respond to O blood. It's pretty benign uh, for the most part. It's kind of like the, the most neutral, I guess, blood, uh, uh, if you could say that. So, um, but then for patients who, say, have AB blood, they really can't receive uh, very much in a way because they have antibodies. I'm um, sorry, they're going to be, um, basically, if you were to give AB blood to somebody, um, you know, in most cases are going to have antigen uh, antibodies available to, to attack that. So we say that uh, AB, because they have no antibodies, they're actually the universal recipient. So this is going to be those patients who can receive any type of blood because they don't really have antibodies against either of them. Okay. So again, transfusion reactions are going to happen if a person gets the wrong type of blood. If they have antibodies against those erythrocytes, and that will cause this agglutination to occur. So basically, the body would recognize these as kind of foreign proteins. It would form antibodies to attack that, cause agglutination, and then eventually cell destruction or hemolysis would occur. Again, this is the thing you'd like to avoid in, in most cases, right? Because you're transfusing blood into a person, you probably don't want that blood to go to waste. Okay? So this is why in most cases, uh, if you were to be like in a trauma uh, center, you know, a level one trauma center or something like that, um, you have a lot of O blood available to give. Because when you have patients rolling into the door, you don't have time to figure out what their blood type is in a lot of cases. They just, you know, they need blood. You're going to give them O blood in order to replace that, right? You also have to worry about the, this RH factor. And so the big one that we're going to be concerned with is antigen D. There are several other antigens available, but antigen D is the main one of our concern uh, when, when giving blood. So basically, um, if you're RH positive, that means you have the antigen. I mean, you don't have an antibody against it. If you're RH negative, uh, that means you do not have an antigen and you uh, potentially can produce uh, antibodies against this. So RH negative does not have the antigen, will not have antibodies unless it's exposed to RH positive blood, either through transfusion or pregnancy. So this actually came up uh, for my personal case because I happen to be positive and my wife is negative. And so we actually have medications that we can give in order to help prevent this problem that occurs. So again, because I'm, uh, you know, when I donate uh, my genetic material uh, to the growing fetus uh, in, in my wife right now, it's a very awkward way to say that, but 
My wife is pregnant right now, and so because I am positive, she has a chance to potentially, uh, that baby has a chance to produce uh, Rh positive blood, okay? And so since my wife does not is negative for that, she would not be, uh, normally, uh, the body would recognize that as foreign and can produce antibodies against that Rh positive blood. And so that's something we want to prevent at all costs because if you end up breaking down the blood cells for the baby, Baby doesn't have any blood. That's not. That's no good, right? And so there's a, a we call this erythroblastosis fetalis uh, when that occurs. We'll show you in another second there. But again, this is something that where uh, it doesn't happen every first time that would occur. So like with our first uh, pregnancy, like the, my wife might not have had any problems, but with each subsequent birth, it becomes much more likely to occur. Um, so for instance, she's pregnant with the second one, so that means that this would be more likely to happen uh, the second time around. Because uh, again, I'm still positive, she's still negative, so that doesn't really ever change for the most part. That also means that, uh, for instance, if you were to have uh, RH negative blood, that means that you need to receive Rh negative blood as well. Otherwise, again, your body would have reactions to that. Uh, if you're positive, then you can receive whatever blood at all, right? So going back to that universal donor, the person that give blood to anyone, who would that be? Be O, and then be the positive or negative? Yeah, O negative. So again, if you're in that trauma situation, O negative blood is what you want to have on hand to be able to give to those patients. Because again, no matter what type of blood they have, even if they're AB positive, um, they can receive O negative, no problem. If they're AB positive, I mean, they can only really receive that O negative for the most part, unless they're also getting AB positive, which is harder to come by. So again, that's why if you have O negative blood, the Red, uh, the red Cross is going to call you up like every two days. You ready to get more blood? You want to get more blood? I'm like, are you guys vampires or what? Because you won't leave me alone. I'm sorry, you can receive blood from anyone, but... Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I meant to say. So AB positive blood, you can't give blood to anyone unless they have AB positive. That's what I meant to say. Thank you for correcting me. Um, right. So again, if you have, if you're O negative, even if you're O positive, because uh, that is still uh, pretty well received by most people, uh, as long as they are Rh positive, um, they they will call you all the time. So. Anywho, uh, and again, uh, the, the AB antigen is going to be passed down by the parents. You're going to get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. Um, so if dad gives you O and mom gives you A, what blood type are you? It's known being A, right? Because then, uh, because you have the A antigen present, the O is going to have none of those antigens present on the cell surface. Uh, if Dad gives you B and Mom gives you A, what are you going to have? It'll be A B. If Dad gives you B and Mom gives you O, it'll still be B. Okay, good. Mom, Dad give you O. O, oh, right. All right. So again, uh, uh, for my wife, because I have positive uh, Rh positive blood, she does not. I mean, I'm given this uh, drug called Rogam. It's actually uh, basically antibodies um, that are meant to uh, bind up any Rd antibodies that she produces. So you can actually have antibodies attack other antibodies, and so that's what we do. So just in case she was producing any antibodies against that Rh positive blood, we have another drug that can go in and bind those up to prevent them from causing any problem for the baby uh, until it's born. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Did you see that any, um, if somebody has RH positive, they can get O negative? They can receive O negative. Just because it's the O or? Because uh, they're still negative, right? So anyone that is uh, positive, um, they cannot give it to anyone who is negative, right? But if they're positive, they can receive any any uh, negative blood too. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Like work through a few problems in your head and like you'll, it'll make more sense to kind of do it, uh, some practice. Okay, and we'll cover on the on the review as well. So, no worries about that. Okay, so any questions so far? Other questions? Okay, I think I'll give you guys a break now. Uh, we'll come back and continue on with this section. About blood clotting. So, how does the process actually occur? Uh, we call this hemostasis, the cessation of bleeding when you have a blood vessel which is damaged. Um, they're going to find that uh, the damage, uh, the when the body detects damage is happening here, uh, several things are going to occur. So, the first thing is mainly going to be vasoconstriction, like to limit the blood flow uh, to that damaged uh, endothelium. Try to prevent any further bleeding. You're going to have formation of this platelet plug. It's usually going to be the first step that happens here. And then formation of this fibrin protein web. Okay. Uh, so we're going to see it's a pretty uh, intricate process how this all occurs. But again, it's going to start with the platelet plug that happens there. You notice that with the platelets, um, that normally uh, the endothelial layer is pretty smooth for the most part because we like things to flow right across it, not have any issues. Um, but when you have this damage that occurs here within the vessel, I should probably use that laser pointer. When you have uh, damage that occurs here is when you're going to start to expose some of those uh, receptors on the, or I'm sorry, the receptors on the platelets. We're going to start to expose some of these, uh, these proteins here uh, on the lining, and that's going to start to trigger those platelets. Say, so, hey, there's damage being done here. We've detected um, these molecules. It's time to start to activate. Um, and you'll notice that the platelet conformation will change. You'll see uh, normally platelets are kind of, uh, kind of 
it's kind of amorphous shape. Uh, when they actually activate, and you can Google pictures of this, they try to like kind of suck in, and there's kind of spindly arms that come out of them that helps to trap other platelets in. Uh, sometimes you get some red blood cells in there. But I'm um, we'll kind of look at this process more in depth. You kind of see when it all occurs. You notice how the, the fibrin web is here. Uh, platelets will be kind of integrated into this as well, along with these red blood cells. Uh, all of that to form that clot itself. So uh, again, what's happening uh, initially, the platelets are gonna bind to collagen that gets exposed when that endothelial damage actually occurs. Uh, and you're gonna find this von Willebrand factor actually gets activated as well. So you can kind of see that von Willebrand factor here. Uh, you can see the collagen kind of along here as well. Um, that's gonna grab onto and hold onto those platelets, okay? And that'll also cause that confirmation to actually occur. Now, the platelets themselves actually release some kind of pro-clotting uh, chemicals as well. That's how they help to recruit more platelets to the site. And so this is going to include things like adenosine diphosphate, the ADP, right? So that's kind of the byproduct of ATP losing that phosphate group. Um, this helps to uh, attract them more, it kind of it makes the platelets a little bit more sticky uh, when they can kind of bind together uh, at that point. Uh, you'll find serotonin will uh, also cause more vasoconstriction at the site of damage. And they'll also have a prostaglandin. You guys remember prostaglandins at all? Yeah. So it's rhomboxane A2 is going to be one of the main ones here uh, that helps to cause vasoconstriction as well. So you're going to find some prostaglandins will be uh, vasodilatory. Uh, some of them are going to be vasoconstrictive. And thromboxane A2 in this case is going to be vasoconstrictive. And so you also notice that platelets will help to activate these uh, plasma clotting factors as well. And so there's lots of kind of cross bridging that occurs here between different factors. And this is where a lot of the times if you were to have, say, um, something like an MI, right? So if you're having myocardial infarction where you have a, a coronary blood vessel that is in, uh, full up of these platelets that are now forming a clot, um, some of the drugs that we'll use actually will prevent these platelets from sticking together. So if you ever heard of the drug aspirin, Right, so aspirin actually helps to prevent uh, prostaglandin formation. Um, so it actually help to deal with this uh, thromboxane A2 and helps prevent activation there. Um, we have other drugs you've ever heard of, like Plavix or Clopidogrel. That's another one actually uh, prevents this ADP uh, uh, from actually interacting with those receptor sites. So lots of different drugs that we'll use here to prevent platelets uh, from clotting together. And so when we talk about those drugs, we'll see there's anticoagulants which is going to be affecting more of the clotting cascade and they have antiplatelet drugs. So aspirin itself will be an antiplatelet drug in this case. So anyway, so again, uh, the platelets are going to be the first step here to causing uh, to recruit more platelets in and then also the, the clotting factor will get, act, or the cascade will get activated through this process as well. You know, things like uh, prostacyclin also may be uh, released here. Nitric oxide uh, is going to be uh, released. These are all going to be vasodilatory. And again, when you have normal flow, we like this. Like We like to keep the vessels open. We like to keep them uh, nice and smooth so they can kind of flow. No problem here. Um, you have inactivated platelets. When you have that collagen being exposed and you have things like von Willebrand factor, that's when you're going to notice this conformational change in the platelets. Thromboxin A2, ADP, all these are going to be released to kind of pull all these platelets together uh, to form that initial plug. And then eventually when the fibrin gets involved, that's when it's going to hold everything kind of together much more stably so. So there's this arachidonic acid pathway that occurs, and this is where you see a lot of the prostaglandins that actually get formed uh, during this process. So normally you have your phospholipids of the plasma membrane. Um, you're able to use uh, some of those to generate this product called arachidonic acid. Okay, this is kind of the, the initial precursor molecule to a lot of the inflammatory molecules that your body makes during either infection or during uh, uh, any kind of inflammation. A lot of it gets processed through arachidonic acid. So we'll talk a lot about this when we get to uh, pharmacology. One of the big enzymes here is going to be cyclooxygenase. Uh, that'll get abbreviated to the COX enzyme system. Uh, and then we'll go through several uh, modifications to eventually form some of these prostaglandins. So you have things like uh, prostacyclin, PGI2. Notice this is going to be antiplatelet aggregation. It's going to be vasodilatory. This is expressed normally when you have uh, you know, a nice smooth endothelium. You have no vascular injury that's occurred there. So prostacyclin is good in those cases. You have PGE2. You have thromboxane E2. Um, these are all going to be leading to... Um, I'm sorry, PGE2 is also going to be vasodilatory. We have things like thromboxane uh, A2, you have PGF2A. These are both going to be vasoconstrictive. They're going to be more likely to cause uh, platelet aggregation as well. So thromboxane A2 is the main one we're going to be focusing on here, at least for our purposes, and talking about that platelet plugs. Um, a lot of these will come back into play when we talk about things like um, uh, vascular blood flow, especially to the kidneys. When we talk about blood pressure and all of that. So we'll see when these come up again. Uh, this other pathway here, uh, the enzyme lipoxygenase, I'll end up producing leukotrienes, and these become important when we talk about asthma. So these are involved with a lot of things like bronchoconstriction, uh, capillary permeability. So this will come up again later when we get to the uh, talk about asthma. 
Okay. So once the platelets get activated, then eventually the clotting cascade is going to be um, activated as well. So again, uh, basically we the final step here is we want the fibrinogen, which is going to be the precursor molecule, gets converted over to fibrin uh, via one of these pathways. And so we'll notice there's both an intrinsic and extrinsic. What's the, the difference between the two? Yeah, so essentially what's going to be kicking off the pathway. So you can notice here in this picture we have the extrinsic pathway on the left side, the intrinsic on, over here on the right side, and it's going to be de uh, determined by which uh, kind of way it gets kicked off, which is kind of the, the initial thing that uh, is going to cause this cascade to occur. You can notice here things like collagen contacts with the platelets, that's going to initiate the, the intrinsic pathway. And notice that with the extrinsic pathway, uh, the, when the vessel wall is damaged, it's when you're going to have tissue factor being involved here. So we'll show you some more pictures of this in a second. But eventually through this cascade, you're eventually going to get this fibrinogen converted to fibrin, which is going to kind of form that nice tight uh, clot that we'd like to develop there. So um, again, the intrinsic exposure to collagen here, extrinsic is going to be more of this tissue thromboplastin, aka tissue factor. So notice that they both kind of culminate in the common pathway as well. Uh, so for the extrinsic pathway, we end up having a tissue factor, a factor three, uh, that's going to activate factor seven, which is eventually going to lead over to uh, eventually factor 10 being activated. So you may think like, well, what's the difference of all these factors? Like, do I need to really know these? This, this does become important. We're talking about especially medications and how we can affect this, at least from, from my pharmacist uh, uh, standpoint. Um, so anyway, so once you have 10 activated, that's eventually going to lead down to, and especially calcium is really important for causing clotting. Uh, factor five is really important here. And it's going to lead to factor two or prothrombin to be activated into thrombin. And that thrombin, that factor two is going to be the main thing that leads to uh, fibrinogen being converted over to fibrin. And then you get that, that clot actually forming there. On the other side, on the intrinsic pathway, is we're going to have uh, factor 12 get activated, factor 11 gets activated by that, and then finally 9. Uh, 8 is going to be kind of uh, uh, helpful here. This is that Christmas factor. Um, I'm sorry, 9 gets activated here. It's that Christmas factor. And then uh, 8 is going to be uh, involved with this as well. That leads to 10 being activated, and you have to get that common pathway. Okay, So if you have a patient who's missing any of these factors, you run into some problems, right, because they're not able to clot effectively. Uh, can you think of anyone who's missing any of these factors? Yeah, hemophiliac patients, right? So oftentimes they're missing like factor eight, uh, and so they end up losing this uh, pathway. So they're only really relying on the extrinsic pathway, which may not be enough for them to clot effectively. So you're really relying on both of these occurring basically at the same time for this to, to happen. And you'll notice that this is a cascade effect. This is a positive feedback loop. So a lot of these will feed back and cause further uh, activation of, of earlier factors to occur. Okay, because we like to have very intense kind of formation of that clot, uh, and then we like to, to be able to inhibit that so we don't clot all over the body. Okay, that's kind of the, the balance we're trying to lead there. But um, notice how calcium is really important here. Whenever you have patients who are getting things like dialysis or if they're on perfusion, so for instance, if you have like open heart surgery uh, where we have to actually stop the heart in order to do surgery on it, uh, they have a perfusionist who will actually take the blood out of your body we have a machine that will oxygenate it, pull off uh, you know, waste products, and then put it back into the body. And so whenever you have blood that you're taking out of the body, you need to make sure it doesn't clot off in those, um, in those plastic tubing, right? Because anytime the body, the blood is getting exposed to things it's not really used to, you can have activation of that clotting cascade. So the, the plastic in there can be a problem. And so we'll use a product called citrate. Uh, citrate can actually bind up that calcium and prevent the clotting from happening. So if you ever hear a patient getting citrate um, in their dialysis uh, uh, solution or things like that, that's usually what's happening there. So the big thing to note, though, is that you can lose a lot of that calcium when you have products like that. So uh, calcium is very, very important for clotting. Oftentimes, those patients end up getting replaced with that. Okay. Uh, so just know that there are a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, it's important that patients have all of them in place. Otherwise, clotting is not going to happen, and they're more likely to bleed. So um, for my purposes, I'm more going to focus on specifically uh, the clotting numbers, necess not necessarily going to be on the specific names, unless we kind of talk about them as such. So for things like fibrinogen, like you probably need to know that that's fibrinogen. Um, prothrombin or thrombin, like that's going to be factor two. That's a pretty common one we're going to be talking about. Um, but things like you know, anti-hemophilic factor, that's probably, we're probably going to call that factor eight. Um, so at least be familiar with kind of both of them. Uh, I'll probably focus more on... Um, the factor numbers on testing questions unless we like specifically talk about them by their by their common name there. Okay, so just more into detail here. Um, so again, the extrinsic pathway is going to be when you have these traumatized tissues causing that tissue factor uh, to be activated here. So again, uh, whenever you have exposure to that collagen, um, that's eventually going to lead to uh, the tissue factor being released there, and it's going to lead to uh, activation of factor seven. Okay, 
7 is going to lead over to uh, activation of factor 10 eventually. Calcium is an important cofactor here. Again, if you don't have calcium, you can't get a good clot forming. Uh, eventually, that's going to lead to uh, activation of uh, prothrombin over into thrombin, the activated form. Again, thrombin is which factor? Two, right? Two is always going to be kind of the end point there. I mean, again, calcium is also going to be involved in this activation here as well. Um, notice that the common pathway is always going to start with factor 10. Okay. Um, this will be important when we're talking about anticoagulants as well, um, because we'll see that they work on different clotting factors depending on um, which, which uh, specific anticoagulants we're, we're discussing. You notice that the intrinsic pathway is going to be a little bit more complicated. A few more factors are involved here. Um, again, when the, the trauma to the blood vessel is going to expose that collagen, activates factor 12, otherwise known as Hagman factor. Um, that's going to eventually going to lead to activation of factor 11. Notice that 9 gets activated then. Um, 8 is going to be kind of a cofactor here. Uh, notice how thrombin kind of feeds back and activates um, this conversion. And you're going to lead over to factor 10. So again, your pat common pathway ends up being uh, affected here as well. And then it lead down to factor uh, 2. And then you have your fiber engine being activated. Okay. And so we have a lot of patients, so that um, especially with uh, small children, because uh, again, if you have hemophilia, um, you know a lot of those patients have uh, a lot of comorbidities and issues. They may not have as long a life expectancy as someone who didn't. We have a lot of children though that come in, and we have to end up replacing a lot of their clotting factors. Uh, namely, factor eight is going to be one of the big ones we end up having to replace with uh, usually a recombinant factor, meaning stuff that we actually generated, not stuff that was like donated by by people. Uh, but again, you can uh, find people who have a lot of that clotting factor. Uh, they keep them on hand at all time. So uh, it's one of those things where you know, especially kids, um, kids like to run around and they like to bump their heads and all kinds of stuff. And so they always have to have their factor on hand because, again, that's their life-saving uh, factor there because their body doesn't produce it. So a lot of times you'll find those patients will carry it around with them. Uh, if they get an injury, they'll go to the ER, have that infused into them, and that way it prevents any um, you know, excessive bleeding from occurring in a lot of those cases. So um, definitely you know, one of those things is like, you know, if you have an anaphylactic allergy to something, you carry an EpiPen with you, those factor patients, they always carry their factor around with, or they should at least. Uh, if not, then that can lead to some big issues. And again, we said that both of these extrinsic and intrinsic pathways will culminate in front of the common pathway. Um, that's going to lead to that conversion of uh, eventually thrombin over into uh, a prothrombin into thrombin, and then you're going to have activation of fibrinogen over into fibrin. That's what's going to lead to that clot. The fibrin, also known as that fibrin stabilizing factor, uh, that's eventually, you know, it's really what's holding everything together platelets, the red blood cells, all of that to make that stable clot. Okay, so um, here's an important thing to note here is that where these clotting factors actually get made, uh, the liver is an important spot for several factors. Uh, so this is good to know. So factor 2, 7, 9, and 10 all get produced within the liver. And so this is one of those things where um, it needs vitamin K in order for this process to occur. And, and where do you normally get vitamin K from? Use your diet. Do you guys know any foods that have vitamin K in it? Spinach is a good one. Popeye had a lot of vitamin K in the system. You know, green leafy vegetables, think about kale, think about things like broccoli, all has like uh, vitamin K and it's really useful for producing a lot of these clotting factors. And so this is actually where the drug warfarin, you guys ever heard of Coumadin or warfarin? Mm -hmm. This is where that drug actually uh, comes into play. It actually prevents you from utilizing that vitamin K. It prevents um, uh, production of these clotting factors here. Also, you can find patients who have pretty extensive liver damage. They're not producing a lot of these clotting factors uh, on their own anyway. And so this is one of those things where uh, we'll, have you guys talked about any uh, coagulation testing? Like PTT, PTINR, right? So PTINR is one of the big things you can actually use to test for production of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And oftentimes, if we have patients who are monitoring for liver dysfunction, you know, you think about your LFTs, you're monitoring like those liver enzymes. A lot of times, though, to actually test how well the liver is working is you look at their PTINR. If their INR is going up, that tells you that they're not clotting as well, and it's telling you that they're not producing a lot of these clotting factors. And you notice like, you know, factor 10, factor 2, factor 7 really being important, the extrinsic pathway, factor 10 and 2 being really important for the uh, common pathway. Um, these are super, super important uh, factors. And if you don't have those available, you're not going to be clotting effectively, you're going to run into problems, okay? So we have patients who are, you know, have pretty extensive liver damage that are more likely to be bleeding due to the fact they're not making these factors there. That make sense? Okay. As you'll look at, especially when we're comparing different anticoagulants, when we're talking about the drugs themselves, we'll talk about different tests that we use to actually monitor their uh, their anticoagulant properties um, based on which factors actually inhibit. So when we're looking at warfarin, we use our PTINR because we know they're specifically affecting these factors from being made within the liver itself. 
in vitamin K rich foods, so things like avocado, uh, limes, basically any kind of green leafy vegetable you can think of, probably good to have. Um, uh, going to have a decent amount of vitamin K in it. Again, it's another one of those fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, we run into problems, especially with patients, um, mentioned patients with cystic fibrosis, they have a hard time absorbing a lot of these fat-soluble vitamins, and so they have uh, can have bleeding issues uh, in some rare instances. Um, this is also uh, one of the big things why we have Coumadin clinics, right? So patients who are on warfarin, um, one of the big things they have to monitor is their diet to make sure they're getting an adequate amount of vitamin K, because if they get too little vitamin K, what would that do to clotting factor production? it would go down, right? Uh, to get too much vitamin K, it would go up. Uh, and so if we have drugs that are trying to keep a nice balance between too much clotting and too little clotting, um, their diet can have a huge effect on that. So we monitor the INR, we, we make sure we tell them, okay, you know, if you have one spinach salad a day, keep it consistent at that. So that way we can anticoagulate you to the right level. Um, but we'll have some patients who say, you know what, I'm gonna be healthy all of a sudden, I'm gonna go from eating no green leafy vegetables, that's all I'm gonna eat. And then all of a sudden the INR goes, goes back down to one essentially, because they're producing so many more clotting factors. So diet is a huge factor with this. And that's why it's again important to have a nice, well-balanced diet. We had uh, issues because I was uh, when I did my rotations in pharmacy school for the Coumadin Clinic. I was in uh, Putnam County, Florida. That's where I, I was uh, born and raised. And um, those patients out there, like they eat a lot of collard greens, a lot of kale, um, because they, they grew it out in their backyards. And so like that was always a huge issue because they had so much vitamin K. It was very hard to anticoagulate them with that that medication. But anyway. So um, we have natural anticoagulants because obviously you don't want to clot all over the body, right? We don't want that positive feedback loop to continue because what could happen? If you just kept clotting kind of ad, ad infinitum. Hmm? Yeah, so you can get uh, a DIC. Do you know what that means? What is that? Disseminated intravascular coagulation. Yeah, so we don't want DIC to occur. Um, that can be a bad thing because you're clotting all over. You can see things like emboli form uh, in the lungs. You can have issues where they form up in the brain. We don't want that to occur for those patients. So we have natural anti in, uh, anticoagulants that can prevent that from happening. Uh, just looking at the endothelial cell surface, you notice that normally it's very smooth. Uh, as long as there's not a lot of like turbulent blood flow, that's where we can end up having um, issues form up. Right. So as long as it's smooth, there you have nice laminar flow. Um, you really don't have a lot of those platelets being activated from that standpoint. Uh, if you think about uh, cases where patients are more likely to provide uh, deformed clots, you think about blood that is very um, either kind of chaotic. Uh, in flow or drug blood that is being very uh, has in stasis essentially not really moving. So when you think about things like a deep vein thrombosis, where does that normally occur? Like in the legs, usually in, it's in a deep vein where the blood's not really flowing super fast, right? So blood is kind of just sticking, sticking around, more likely to clot, uh, especially if you're like on a long plane flight or something like that. Or if you think about atrial fibrillation where the atria is just kind of just quivering, uh, that's very turbulent. That can lead to clot formation happening there as well. Um, but if you have nice, smooth uh, endothelial layers, that usually allows for um, pretty good flow, not a whole lot of clot formation. You also have uh, this glycocalyx, which is going to repel clotting factors and also platelets, so it prevents them from uh, really adhering to that endothelial wall. And then you also have this thrombomodulin, which actually binds up that factor two or that thrombin, uh, and will activate factor uh, protein C. Protein C is a natural anticoagulant that will inactivate factor five and also factor eight, right? So it can be uh, very useful for preventing kind of uh, natural clots from forming on their own where they're not really needed. The other big enzyme that's uh, useful here is going to be antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3 is going to be working with a uh, natural product called heparin. Uh, again, our bodies produce heparin. It actually helps to make antithrombin-3 actually work better. It actually helps to catalyze that reaction. And so essentially what you can see is antithrombin is able to bind up with uh, heparin. In this case, this would be like a uh, like normal heparin we would give like in the hospital. Uh, but essentially, uh, it's able to bind up with uh, usually factor... Uh, uh, usually we talk about factor 10 and 2 being kind of most important here, but it's also going to be affecting factor uh, 9, 11, and 12. And so you can uh, basically will uh, catabolize these factors uh, pretty, pretty quickly. So heparin plus antithrombin works much more fast than just antithrombin 3 on its own. Uh, but that will help to lead uh, to prevent uh, kind of excessive clotting from occurring. So, um, and then you have finally plasmin. This is going to be uh, converted from plasminogen. So plasminogen is going to be the inactivated form. And so when you have a clot that's ready to be uh, degraded and gotten rid of, this is where plasmin comes into play. And that will actually help to digest fibrin clots. Uh, so if you ever hear like someone who had like a stroke or if they had like an MI, we give them a clot buster. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we're giving them is this exogenous tissue plasminogen activator. We give them something that actually convert their plasminogen over into plasmin, and that helps to degrade a lot of those clots, right? So if someone has like a massive PE or massive stroke, um, sometimes we can give that to them, and that will help to break down their clot very quickly in a lot of cases. 
So you can see where a lot of the drugs are coming into play. A lot of it, we're utilizing uh, the clotting cascade to either inhibit it to prevent uh, a clotting from occurring, or we can sometimes actually uh, increase the uh, breakdown of those clots. And here, this is important um, because we know uh, that the way that heparin works in antithrombin 3, we can actually monitor different uh, coagulation uh, tests to see how well the patient anticoagulates. So like for this one, because it affects uh, 9, 11, 12, 2, and 10, we actually monitored the APTT. You guys are familiar with that? You guys know what that stands for? Activated, Activated partial thromboplastin time. Yeah, so APTT is going to be more uh, associated with things like heparin and monitoring for anticoagulation than we saw with like uh, warfarin that affected the PTINR. That was in those 2, 7, 9, and 10, right? So anyway, so the whole point here is that we have natural anticoagulants that will prevent uh, clotting from occurring because we don't want clots to happen where we don't need them, right? Otherwise, you'd have uh, emboli and, uh, or blockage of flow, and that's going to be no good for us. All right. So uh, moving towards uh, talking about circulation and how blood's going to be flowing. So we have arterial blood. Um, again, anything going through an artery is going to be heading away from the heart, so exiting away from the heart. Usually it's going to be oxygenated blood. The only exception to that is going to be with blood going to the lungs, and it's going to be through the pulmonary arteries. Okay, so and that's going to be connected to the right side or the left side of the heart. Is no. Is actually going to be on the right side of the heart. So things coming out of the right side of the heart to the to the lungs is going to be the pulmonary artery. So even those deoxygenated blood heading from the right side of the heart into the lungs, and we'll go over this in more detail. Um, those are going to be carrying deoxygenated blood. They're still considered arteries because they're heading away from the heart. And then with venous blood, it's going to be entering toward the heart, and most of the time it's going to be deoxygenated blood, except for blood coming from the lungs, which is going to be our pulmonary veins. You can kind of see here how we have the the vena cava, which is the main site where uh, venous blood is going to be returning to the heart. It's going to be the right atrium through the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary valve, and then to the pulmonary arteries. And notice how the kind of uh, left and right lung uh, kind of bifurcate there. You then have the pulmonary veins. Now this is red, it's carrying oxygenated blood. That's going to go through the left atrium, left ventricle, and eventually out to the aorta. Uh, again, so these again can be your, your main arteries here. Does that make sense? Okay, so moving on, uh, to a little bit more about structures of the heart. So, four main chambers. For the most is, is review for you guys, right? Um, yeah, good. All right, so the right atrium, this is mainly going to be receiving deoxygenated blood from the body, right? Uh, the right ventricle is going to be pumping that deoxygenated blood to the lungs specifically, right? Through, through those uh, pulmonary arteries. It's going to then get oxygenated within the uh, lungs, and it's going to come back into the left atrium. That's where it's going to receive the oxygenated blood, and then eventually leave uh, through the left ventricle, out the aorta, and then to the rest of the body. Again, um, it's kind of a simplified diagram, kind of how this works versus kind of how uh, it's a little bit kind of more kind of intermingled when you're actually looking at the, the organ itself. Uh, which one do you think is a kind of a more uh, low pressure system? Right side or left side? Yeah, right side is going to be a much more low pressure system. It's the venous side. Uh, the left side is going to be much more the, the high pressure system. Uh, so we'll talk about that and what kind of uh, effects that's going to have uh, on that in the upcoming lectures as we go forward. So looking at the pulmonary circulation between the heart and the lungs, you're going to see the blood pumps to the lungs via those pulmonary arteries, as we mentioned, and it's going to return back to the heart through the pulmonary veins. You can kind of see the pulmonary veins kind of coming in here, uh, pulmonary uh, arteries leaving uh, through here. So again, keep your uh, left and right side uh, straight. Know where the oxygenated and versus deoxygenated blood is going to be flowing from that standpoint. Um, and as far as the systemic circulation between the heart and the body tissues, obviously the blood's going to be pumping uh, to the body via the aorta, uh, and then it's going to be returning through the venous system, through the inferior and superior vena cava. So this is where most of the blood is going to be returning from. Uh, it's going to be leaving the left side of the heart through the uh, aortic arch there. Have you guys covered this in anatomy yet? Any? Okay, so you guys will probably get there pretty soon if I had to guess. Um, so you can kind of see how uh, the blood's going to be flowing here. Again, most of the oxygenation should be occurring here within the lungs. We're going to be exchanging, uh, breathing off CO2. Uh, again, we'll talk about how pH and things like temperature are going to be affecting that when we get to the respiratory section. But essentially, we're going to be uh, getting rid of CO2 from oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to be picking up O2, and that's going to be coming back into the lungs uh, through, or coming back into the heart through the left side there, right through those pulmonary veins, uh, coming back into the heart. We can then be circulated out. Um, here in the tissues, we're going to notice that you know uh, blood's going to transfer from the arteries through the capillaries, where tissue oxygen exchange can occur. It's going to be dropping off oxygen, picking up CO2, and then being delivered back through uh, the venous system. So pretty straightforward for the most part. 
we run into lots of problems that we run into this uh, with pediatrics quite a bit where they have uh, cardiac defects where they may have um, holes in places where there should be no holes and they actually have uh, venous and arterial blood mixing uh, which can be problematic and lead to uh, poor tissue um, oxygenation things like that um, but you guys will cover that and probably that's some other classes but we're very kind of uh, very busy cardiac uh, unit over in Amores. We're dealing with a lot of these um, cardiac dysfunctions where they can have holes between the, the ventricles. Um, they can have uh, holes that should have closed upon birth, not closing, and issues like that. So we run into lots of cardiac issues with those kids with these congenital problems. Okay, so I mentioned um, with the pulmonary circulation coming out of the right ventricle, going through the pulmonary arteries, uh, should have low O2 content. That's why the blood's very dark, because it's that deoxyhemoglobin, gets a darker color to it. Uh, the veins coming through the pulmonary veins, uh, there's going to have high O2 content and then eventually terminate into the left atrium. On the flip side, you're going to have the systemic circulation. Uh, source is mainly going to be coming through the left ventricle, leaving through the aorta. That's where it has high O2 content. Coming back through the venous system after it drop, drops off O2 at the capillaries, uh, it's going to be coming through the superior inferior vena cava, through those branches and then uh, have low O2 content because at that, that point is deoxyhemoglobin uh, and can will terminate into the right atrium. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so uh, talking about the valves here, uh, basically we have the atrioventricular valves, which they're going to be separating the atria and the ventricles, so it's kind of in the name there, so it keeps it pretty straight. Um, you'll notice here that you have the tricuspid valve. It's going to be between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So you see the tricuspid valve here, and then you're going to have the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve uh, separating the left atrium and the left ventricle. So what's kind of the difference between why is one a tricuspid and one the bicuspid? Yeah, it has to do with the chordae tendon and how many flaps it has in order to, to prevent the flow. So what's the, the point of, of these valves? What do they do for us? Yeah, they prevent backflow essentially, right? So when we have, uh, we're talking about systole of the ventricles, they're trying to pump blood out of the heart. Uh, we need that back pressure to occur to close these valves up. So that way we don't have blood flowing uh, back into the left atrium or back into the right atrium. We like to keep those closed. So that way only blood is leaving through the pulmonary valve or leading through the aortic valve. Okay, that's the main thing we're going to see there. And again, they're going to be closed during ventricular systole. That's going to direct blood flow strictly to either the body or the lungs uh, through those, those semilunar valves, which we'll talk about in just a second. But basically, um, prevent that black flow. Uh, usually when the ventricles are contracting, that's also going to lead uh, these to tighten up, uh, these, these uh, chordae tendinae there. By having those tight, which you can see here when you have that ventricular systole, um, what's that trying to do there? What's the whole point of having this chordae tendinae there? Yeah, even from everting, right? So that way they don't have, uh, they, they don't go too far out uh, and it'll cause that, that flow to occur. Because then if that doesn't happen, what, what, can, what would you call that? Regurgitation, yeah. So if you like mitral valve regurgitation, that's where you see that happening where the blood is still able to flow through back up into the atria, right? So the, the valve's not working appropriately. Um, can we do anything about that? Yeah, you can replace it, right? So you can either do like a porcelain valve or you can do like a mechanical valve or you can actually take out the whole thing and then put in a, a new valve for those patients, right? So uh, pretty invasive. Uh, I actually got to see one of these when I was on rotations and it was probably the coolest thing I ever saw. Uh, see them actually use, um, they use a solution called cardioplegia, which is basically like a high potassium solution. It basically just stops the heart and just kind of bathe it in. And uh, basically you see the heart beating and they just stop and you're like, oh, this guy's dead now. Uh, if it wasn't for this perfusion machine pumping him uh, blood through, but basically able to go in, change out the valves, that way it would have something that would not regurgitate so much uh, blood flow back into the, uh, into the atria. Because otherwise, if you had that, that blood flow not happening appropriately, you're not getting enough uh, oxygenated blood out to the body, uh, and don't have good tissue uh, oxygenation at that point. Okay. So again, that, those papillary muscles, that chordae tendine, those are going to tighten up when the ventricles uh, contract to prevent that efflux uh, from occurring, the eversion uh, from happening. All right, so then we have the semilunar valves. These are going to be located between uh, the ventricles and the arteries. Uh, they're going to be leaving the heart. So we have the pulmonary valve. This is going to be located uh, right here. This is going to be between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary artery. And we have the aortic valve. It's going to be between the left ventricle and then the aorta. Uh, you can see that right here, the aortic valve. And so basically it's going to be closed during ventricular diastole or that relaxation phase, and that prevents blood from kind of flowing back into the ventricles. Okay. So the big thing here is when you have uh, ventricular systole, yeah, that pressure has to be big enough in order to cause these valves to open up, right? So pressure opens these valves versus uh, the mitral and the um, tricuspid valve. Those the pressure is going to close those valves, okay? And so we'll look at that. We'll talk about isovolumic contraction and relaxation and all that stuff uh, probably in the next section here. But just know that. Um, notice here that if you say in the aorta, if you had a ton of pressure here, what's that going to do to when you have a, the ventricular systole happen? 
Is it going to be easier to open or harder to open? If you have just a ton of pressure in the aorta, it's going to be harder to open up, right? Because we need more, the ventricles have to squeeze harder to force that blood out. And so that's where we're going to run into a lot of problems when we talk about afterload. It's going to be a big issue with uh, patients who have a hypertension, um, CHF, a lot of issues come about from uh, this kind of altered pressure differentials and trying to keep that blood flowing appropriately. So we'll talk more about that uh, as we go forward. But again, these are closed during diastole, during relaxation, that prevents blood from flowing back into the ventricles. But here you can notice these uh, papillary muscles. It was a neat GIF kind of showing uh, how uh, when the, the ventricles contract, how this is kind of closing that valve up, right? Um, again, preventing that eversion from, or the efflux from happening, uh, the, any of that regurgitation from happening back into the atria. All right, so heart sounds. What are the heart sounds? Bub? Dub? Okay, good. You guys are, you guys are practically PAs already. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. It's more than I knew when I got into school. Uh, anyway, so basically that lub is going to be this closing of the AV valve. So it's important to know which uh, sounds are associated with which valves closing and opening because that will allow you to kind of determine where the problem is, right? So if you're able to hear differentiation, uh, if you're able to hear some uh, issues with the, the lub, you're going to know that's going to be a problem with the AV valves actually closing. And so this is going to occur during ventricular systole. That's going to be your first heart sound. That's going to be the S1 sound. Um, so again, when these guys close and the ventricles contract, the ventricular systole, that pressure is going to cause these valves to close, right? The mitral uh, tricuspid valve and the mitral valve here, and it causes it to close, and that's going to be that first lub sound, it's going to be the S1. Okay, so if you heard issues here, if they had mitral valve regurgitation, this is where you probably end up hearing it, right? And on the dub, this is going to be a closing of those semilunar valves, so the aortic valve and the pulmonic uh, valve. Uh, when those end up closing, that's where you get the dub. And this is not the dub step, just the dub. Uh, and then so this is occurring when you have ventricular diastole, right? So as the ventricles relax and they kind of uh, pull open, it's going to cause the pressure in both the pulmonary uh, arteries and also the um, pulmonary arteries and also the aorta. That pressure is high enough now, uh, as compared to the ventricle, that causes those valves to close. So once those close, that causes your dub. That's uh, the second sound. And you notice you can actually have a splitting of this S2 that can occur. And so this actually occurs during inspiration. So basically they have this P2 and that's basically gonna be that pulmonic valve that's occurring there. So again, you'll hear the aortic valve closing first followed by that pulmonic valve. Okay, it's called that S2 splitting. And basically this occurs during inspiration. And when, you're, uh, when you have an inspiration, you say, that's a really good idea, I'm gonna go do that. Uh, but when you actually have real inspiration, okay, um, basically you're decreasing that intrathoracic pressure, right? So you have decreased pressure. That means it's gonna take longer for that pulmonary pressure to exceed uh, the right ventricle pressure. So essentially the pressure is gonna be lower on this side of the uh, this side of the valve. It's gonna take longer for that to close down uh, during that diastole. Okay, so it's only during inspiration. That's when you have a patient breathe in, you hear that, uh, hear that splitting. If they were to breathe out, you probably not hear that splitting any, any further. Make sense? Okay. So again, it's uh, when you're having uh, closure of the AV valves, again, this is gonna be due to pressure being higher on the ventricle side, closing it, Bring that backflow to the uh, to the aor uh, the the uh, atrias. On the other hand, when you have the S2 sound, there's going to be the higher pressure differential here in the arteries. We're going to be closing that pressure down to prevent backflow into the ventricles, right? Because we want to keep that blood be pumped out to stay out outside of the heart. And so uh, here's just an example of some of the different heart sounds that you can hear based on uh, where you're placing your stethoscope at. Um, so for instance, you, over here, uh, if you're placed on this area, the second intercostal space, right at the sternal board is where you can hear the aortic uh, area. Uh, you can hear the pulmonic area by switching over to the other side of the heart there. Herb's point, uh, which uh, I had to look up, but that was where you can hear certain uh, certain uh, murmurs and things like that can be heard uh, specifically at that point. And there's also an area we can hear the tricuspid and then the mitral valve as well. So these are different sound places you place your stethoscope to hear if there's any issues with those valves, uh, either opening or closing, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so any questions on this first section? All right, so uh, I guess I have a little bit extra time. Do you just want to do like 10 minute break and then we'll go into the next section? We'll finish up a little early. Okay, let's do a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back and then continue on.